Okay, so uh, maybe I'll make a start if that's okay. Um, welcome everybody. Um, delighted to uh, welcome you to our inaugural BT University of Bristol lecture in celebration of our long-standing and impactful partnership. Uh, I'm Professor Phil Taylor. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise at the University of Bristol. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce this lecture this evening. Um, I'm a networks researcher myself, but an energy networks researcher, not a communications uh, or communications networks researcher. So I'm going to be really interested to, uh, to hear the lecture tonight. We've got a really strong and rich history of research and education collaboration uh, and a strong record of working together at the leading edge of science, technology and innovation uh, with BT. And our collaboration spans a really diverse range of areas such as future networks, digital, creative, quantum, cyber security and robotics. Lots of really fascinating subjects that are really important uh, to our future research efforts. Um, so um, just to introduce Tim briefly, Professor Tim Whitley. Uh, Tim is the MD of Applied Research for BT and the MD of BT's R&D campus at Ad Astral Park in Suffolk, England. He is uh, accountable for all aspects of BT's global research activities, which includes applied research, technology and partnerships with world leading universities. Tim is a member of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, which is actually where I first came across Tim a few years ago. Uh, Tim is also a board member for the New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership and is a visiting professor with the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering at the University of Essex. And he's also a William Pitt Fellow at Pembroke College, Cambridge. So we're really, really pleased to have Tim here to speak to us this evening. Uh, Tim joined BT in 1981. Hope I'm not giving his age away too much there by... <laughs> uh, divulging that information as a telephone engineering apprentice in North Wales and has held roles in research, technical architecture, strategic analysis and corporate strategy. Tim holds a BSc in physics and a PhD in optical fibre systems. So uh, a brief introduction, introduction to the lecture now. Uh, Professor Tim Whitley is going to take us on a journey through purposeful innovation and what this has meant so far for the world of communications. He will describe how BT and the University of Bristol have contributed and where the next exciting changes will come from. Uh, we envisage that the lecture session will be an hour in total and there will be approximately 20 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so myself and Tim will uh, be there at the end to field questions if you have any. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Tim now. And um, please, uh, we're, we're keen to hear your lecture, Tim. Over to you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Phil. And uh, good evening, everybody. Katie, perhaps we could uh, pull up the, uh, the first slide. And um, <coughs> I must begin um, by... Uh, saying what a pleasure it is to have the opportunity to deliver the inaugural lecture of what we uh, firmly hope and believe will become a, an annual tradition um, between BT and Bristol. Uh, as Phil's just said, we've got uh, we've had a, a long historic and very fruitful relationship with Bristol University, which we um, sort of further cemented last year in September when we signed a strategic university relationship between BT and uh, and the university. Uh, so it's a, a real pleasure to uh, to be chatting to some some good friends on this call, um, but also on uh, what we hope will be the start of, uh, of a, a really important lecture series. Uh, as, as Phil's just said, my plan was to, I'm conscious, sort of got multiple audiences here, I'm conscious there's folk here who know BT really, really well, and there's also people, folk on the call who, who maybe don't know BT quite so well, and um, maybe even be surprised at the the degree to which BT takes an interest in research, even that we have a lab. So I thought I'd um, begin by sort of 
orientating you as to the way BT thinks about purposeful innovation. And, you know, even that's a funny phrase, isn't it? Even what do we mean by purposeful innovation? Um, in doing so, catch you up on some of the uh, the sort of the, the, the metrics around BT's R&D activities. Illustrate a couple of recent examples, particularly examples which have had um, Bristol involvement of purposeful innovation, and then maybe a bit of a nod towards the future. Some of the exciting things we're doing, uh, and um, maybe that'll be a good point for a conversation after the uh, after the lecture. So that's my plan. Um, Katie, if we can have the uh, the next slide. I'll begin with um, this funny. Ah, hold on. I'm going to say I have a daughter who has just started playing the piano. And I'm going to go and tell her to stop playing the piano. Hold on a second. It's an unexpected start to lecture. Wait, there was it. We may actually have some Harry Potter background music here, played by my daughter, if we're not careful. Um, so <laughs> let me begin with the um, the purposeful innovation. And this is a, an interesting, there's a funny phrase and a funny date on this slide. Um, and it allows me to do two things. First of all, orientate you as to what BT means by purposeful innovation. And it's essentially uh, this triangle. It's a dead simple definition, and it's something that I know Bristol University passionately also believe in. And it's that fusion of science with real world engineering. So discovery led, curiosity led, that, that lovely thing in this country that um, we're really rather good at. Um, discovery science combined with real world practical engineering, doing things, you know, not just once, but a hundred thousand times, doing it in a way which can be uh, deployed in the real world efficiently, economically, a business case that works, that whole broad definition of what um, engineering is. Uh, but the most important thing to a purpose, you know, to do something useful, something useful for a customer or a citizen. And that can be dead simple, could be a really cool new app for, um, for uh, you know, a, a new feature on a, a BT Sport app, it could be something that uh, means your broadband performs a bit better, um, or it could be something that genuinely transforms society. That's what we mean by purposeful innovation. Um, the date allows me to give you a little bit of history of BT and where we come from, and it's our, our origin story. The corporate books would tell you BT goes back to 1846. Our origin story goes back nine years earlier to a collaboration between the two characters you see on this slide. Uh, the chap on the left is uh, an, um, uh, an academic, a kit professor at King's University, um, Sir Charles Wheatstone, so well known to all the electrical engineers on this call, I'm sure. The guy on the right uh, might be working at the engine shed in, uh, in, in Bristol if, uh, if he were here today. He's a, an entrepreneur, a chap called William Fothersgill Cook. And these two characters were contemporaries of Michael Faraday, friends of Michael Faraday, in fact. Um, and they got super excited about the role that the phenomena of electricity and magnetism could play in the world of communications. They had this bonkers idea that you could use the recently discovered phenomena to communicate over distance. On the 12th of June, 1837, they filed a patent for the world's first practical electric telegraph. A year later, they built it. There's a picture of it. And you can see that today in the uh, Science Museum in London at the Information Age uh, Gallery. Um, nine years later, they founded the electric telegraph company. If you click to the next slide, Katie, um, you'll see a little graphic of that seminal moment. The electric telegraph company is the oldest telecommunications company in the world, and it's where BT came from. We're descended from that organization. And this chart, which and that's a beautiful example, I think, of purposeful innovation and a beautiful example of what can come when uh, academia and business collaborate together looking after that triangle that effectively gave time to the nation um, that's what the electric telegraph did down this down the, uh, the the centuries there's been many other examples that bt has had a hand in through our labs through academic partners through working in partnership with other industrial players uh, and this is just a few of them i'm not going to do them all because we'll, we'll definitely blow the time budget but there's a, a couple worth calling out the first time a human in north america spoke to a human in um, in Europe, happened to be the UK, was 1926. And it was a wireless transmission experiment. This was a collaboration between AT&T Bell Labs and the Post Office Engineering Research at the time. Um, 
an amazing moment. Just think of that. Two humans speaking in real time for the first time across the continents. Um, 1943, the computer scientists on this call will know well of the, the code breaking uh, efforts of uh, Turin's team at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. Max Newman, Bill Tutt, and of course Turin himself. History shaping um, computer science uh, and, uh, and, and code breaking expertise. What's less well known is that the machine that was built to run uh, the uh, decode the Lorentz cipher was called Colossus. And it was built by a bloke called Tommy Flowers, who was a post office engineering researcher. So it's a beautiful example of academia coming together with industrial research to do something that either alone could, could not. Today, we have something called the Tommy Flowers Institute, which Bristol is a, uh, a part of, which is all about bringing postdoctoral researchers and PhD students together with industrial researchers, essentially bringing that magic of collaboration. The only other one I'll mention on here, because it's pertinent uh, to the lab, uh, the geographic, the lab I now run, the geographic lab, but we just that uh, Phil just mentioned, the Dastral Park, is the one in 1984. 1984 was the first time this stuff, and I doubt you can see that, but this is single mode optical fiber. These are the, the hair thin strands of glass, the sort of the, the feet of engineering and chemistry that underpin our digital connected world. Um, this stuff was not invented by BT. It was invented by somebody called Charles Keogh who won the Nobel Prize. In 1984 though, in the UK, the first commercial single mode fiber went live between Milton Keynes and Luton. And that was basically as a result of work here in the UK, again, between academia and BT labs at Marshalsham, uh, really nutting their way through the engineering challenges of my purposeful innovation triangle. So some brilliant examples of how these innovations can genuinely change the world. Katie, if you flip to the next slide, it's still a, uh, a list of things which are history, but getting much more contemporary. And I'll, I'll, I'll just point to some of the things on here will be things I'll talk about in a moment. And they give you a sense of the the timeline, the length of time of going from that sort of first um, the paper or academic um, paper or laboratory demonstration through to actual deployment. Some of these, of course, have now hit the streets. 5G, there's a number of 5G world firsts on here, but of course that's something that's very active in the UK now as you roll out across the UK. Quantum technology that is, is features uh, heavily on these world firsts is something that's just on the cusp of making it to the market. But uh, this is the sense of what we mean by purposeful innovation. Katie, if you go to the next slide, I'll just give you a few stats. If you're serious about innovation, you've got to invest in it. These are the, the sort of stats that govern BT's uh, activity in this space. Um, we're a top 10 investor in R&D, but just under three billion in the last five years. Uh, we've got more than one pattern now, just over 5,000. And we find about 100 inventions a year, um, which sort of ranks us fourth of UK businesses for filing intellectual property with the European Patent Office. Um, and that's not just in telecoms or technology, that's across all sectors. So it's a very important part of making sure the services we offer globally, um, uh, you know, are not subject to, uh, to um, legal challenge anywhere. Um, 30 direct relationships with university or over 30 only four strategic university relationships, one with Cambridge, one with MIT, one with Tsinghua, and one very pleasingly now with Bristol University. Um, and a surprising one there that may surprise the comp science um, uh, researchers, but if you look at the UK Patent Office over the last 20 years, BT's actually for, filed more IPR than any British institution, uh, public or private, in the area of AI and, uh, and AI uh, computer science algorithms. So uh, something that we take very seriously and of course is very important right now as we, we harness the power of uh, computer science and AI. Um, if we flick to the next slide, please, Katie. So this is the lab I head. Um, you are all in Bristol. Uh, I am sitting in Suffolk. I'm about uh, a quarter of a mile from the sea and my lab is about 10 miles further inland. So we're just just on the outskirts of um, the county town of Ipswich. Um, it is the lab and it is the, the hub of our innovation centre, though I'll, I'll paint a, a little bit of colour around that in a moment. But it's also a, a much more than that for BT. It's our main UK operations centres for our fixed networks are based here. That's our global network and our uh, national networks. Um, it's sort of our global engineering HQ. Uh, it's got a very large tested integration facility, which is an important part of the whole technology introduction process. Um, 
And it's not just a BT site anymore. There are about two and a half thousand BT people. There's about 500 people who work for OpenReach, which is, as many of you know, that sort of legally separate element of BT that looks after the access network for all operators. But there's also about 150 other companies on the park employing about a thousand people. So we've been growing um, much as Bristol has been doing over the last uh, decade or so, recognizing the value of clustering and bringing businesses together to enjoy that happenstance and serendipitous interaction we've been doing the same on our campus and uh, we're now up to about 150 companies and a thousand non-BT people and we convene people here so about 60,000 non-BT people each year all uh, really interested in the sort of things that you on this call are interested in understanding how science and new knowledge can help solve problems and make things better for customers and for citizens alike if we have the next slide please uh, Katie well, that's the HQ of our research, but we've a footprint around the place. Um, in the UK, um, we have a lab in Bristol, which we are growing. Um, so my network AI activity is uh, is led out of the uh, the team that I have in Bristol, and that's an area we're growing as we deepen our relationship with uh, with the university and the region more generally. Um, we also have um, a lab in uh, MIT, uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, one in Bangalore, one in the Middle East, um, and a centre at Ul uh, Ulster University in uh, Northern Ireland, and a small uh, lab at Cambridge University, sort of our local university here in Suffolk. So it's a very simple model of scouring the, the sort of hotbeds, if you like, of innovation, be they in the UK or be they globally, and then bringing that intelligence and that knowledge back to the UK so we can work at how we can solve problems and make things better for our customers. Have the next slide, please, uh, please, Katie. So some of you might be thinking, well, BT is not a manufacturer, so why do you do all this? Well, really simple. Understanding future potential is something we fundamentally believe is how you keep ahead of uh, the curve and make sure that you're part of that future. It's also incredibly important, as we're not a manufacturer, to understand what the art of the possible is, effectively to encourage that global ecosystem of suppliers to create what we need and our customers need in this country, um, not perhaps what's available elsewhere or, or what they might want to sell us. It's also very true that telecommunications is clearly a global thing. It'd be really knocking if your phone didn't work when you went uh, went abroad. So working uh, with international standards and global international standards is a really important part of what BT does, along with other provide other operators in the UK, to make sure that the technology that is globally standardised and is produced suits the needs of uh, UK citizens and our customers uh, around the globe. So really important part of being an, uh, an informed purchaser. And finally, and particularly important in the areas of the emergent areas of um, AI and machine learning, it's all about applying that new knowledge to our domain of expertise. Um, I'm sure many on this call know the challenge of what, what seems to be a good idea, uh, you know, on the face of it, the journey from that good idea to actual economic and societal benefit is really quite a tricky one and it requires a coming together of expertise and domain expertise and that's one of the uh, the things that uh, one of the reasons that we do applied research as an organization if you flip to the next slide please katie and next one as well so that's caught you up 180 years um, you know how BT thinks about innovation now, you've had some things we've done in the past and you've got some other stats on uh, the work we do um, what I want to do now is just turn to a few examples and this is one that uh, Bristol University have had a, a real hand in and it's um, Ultra Mimer, what on earth is that? That's uh, multiple in, multiple out. This is all about a really important and purposeful uh, thing which is um, the capacity that we have to service these things, our mobile phones. It's to do with um, how much utility we can get out of the spectrum we buy. If you flick on to the next slide please, um, Katie, and I'll explain what on earth I'm talking about. This is a picture of some antennas, which uh, the radio engineer Mark Beach on the call will be delighted. I'm sure he'll be excited to see these antennas because he likes antennas. The left hand one there is a state of the art 4G antenna. The right hand of those three is a state of the art 5G antenna. And that's a very special one because it's the very first 5G antenna to go live anywhere in the UK. Um, and it went live at uh, Dastral Park. You can see the uh, our radio tower in the background there. The chart on the right hand side is a, a really is plotting a really important metric for 
mobile systems. It's how many bits per second we can get out of every hertz of electrical bandwidth. So if you think about a mobile network, the spectrum, the radio spectrum is effectively the fuel of that network. It dictates the performance and the quality and the coverage of the services that we can offer. So bits per second per hertz is a really important metric. Now the, the five and the three figures that you see in the two left-hand columns of that chart are the ideal and the real world performance you can get out of a state-of-the-art 4G antenna. Three and a half bits per second per hertz. That's typically what we get out of the 4G network we rolled uh, rolled out across the UK. The 31, which is tantalizingly, you know, 10 times bigger, um, and the 15 are the measurements we did a couple of years ago on that very first 5G antenna. And there, this was pre social distancing and all that sort of thing. But in a way, they sort of represent a socially distance and a non-socially distance measurement. The 31 bits per second per hertz was achieved by taking handsets and distributing them beautifully, spacing them separately, giving nice spatial separation between them, and then measuring the capacity we could get. And that was the result. Almost 10 times the capacity for the same chunk of spectrum that we get out of a state-of-the-art 4G network. The 15 is where we did something really silly. We took all the handsets and piled them on top of each other and then saw what we could get. And what we got was uh, still a very impressive result. So what are we doing here? How is this happening? How are we suddenly getting 10 times the capacity out of the same bit of electrical spectrum? If you flick to the next chart, Katie, and, uh, I, I, and that's, that's lovely, thank you. The thing I love about this example is that anybody who did sort of high school physics, so, you know, secondary school, O level, if you're my age, or GCSE, will be able to get the basic idea of what's going on here. And it's all to do with interference. In fact, anybody who's ever thrown a pebble in a pond and observed those beautiful um, circular waves that come out and then maybe thrown another pebble in and observed the way the waves interact with each other and noticed that in some areas they add up and in some areas they they detract, they, they subtract from each other, you get interference. That's what's going on here. The little picture in the middle is, is, a, is a, a pond that's having two droplets of water dropped into it. And what you can see is there's a sort of funny dark fringes or dark regions. And that's where the waves are actually destructively interfering and cancelling each other out. So you can see we're getting structure to this wave. And what we're doing with this MIMO, this funny multiple in, multiple out, is essentially playing the same game, only this time with radio antennas and applying the same physics to allow us to give structure to the radio waves and the way we can use these, um, these radio waves. The graphics, the blobby graphics on the top are some simulations for just two antennas, eight antennas, or 64. And that 5G antenna that I showed you is a 64 transmit, 64 receive antenna element. And what you can see is incredible structure. And what that allows us to do is to reuse spectrum in the same geographic space again and again and again, and therefore get those impressive increases in overall capacity. The sort of spotty diagrams in the bottom left and right to telecoms folk on the call, they'll recognize them as constellation diagrams. And really all you need to know is that if you imagine your game was to try and differentiate between the blobs, the left hand chart's really hard, the right hand chart's really easy. And that's what happens when we create these multi element antennas and, uh, uh, and, and basically we can create multiple communication channels from the same spectrum. Multiple in, multiple out. This is one of the technologies that means 5G is going to give us so much more capability than 4G. If you flick onto the next slide, please, Katie. And this is the road to 5G. And I wanted to show this because it sort of gives a sense of the richness of the interaction between not only Bristol University and BT, but also that wider ecosystem. So the left hand side shows you some of the uh, experiments, some of the measurements we've been doing. And in particular, you can see some of uh, Mark Beach's team's work here. Um, uh, world beating work, which was in particular, if you look at the picture in the sort of roughly in the middle of the picture, there's a massive box with lots of wires. That's an antenna from um, uh, Mark's lab, which was brought up to my lab at Adastral Park and achieved some world leading um, way beyond actually what I've just showed you efficiencies in terms of bits per second per hertz. So this is really building confidence as to what the art of the possible is in terms of these now ultra MIMO capabilities. The graphics on the right look like, you know, meetings, don't they? They are meetings, they're standards meetings, but these are meetings, seminal meetings over the last few years where representatives in the UK have 
essentially driven changes into international standards which have a material impact on the performance that we get when we deploy these technologies in the UK. Performance in a 20 to 30 percent improvements in coverage and capacity as we roll out these 5G networks. So a really important part of this broad ecosystem of purposeful innovation. If you flick on to the, uh, the next slide, I should say on that journey, of course, you'll know BT was the first to launch um, 5G a uh, year before last with our EE brand. And the UK was one of the first, all major operators obviously have launched now. And the UK is one of the first um, leading countries in the world to launch 5G. So this is, this is real lab to, lab to live stuff that's happening um, really speedily and pleasingly so. And this chart really illustrates some of the exciting work to go because I still really don't have an answer as to what the limit is of the bits per second per hertz we can get out of these systems. So you can see some of the test facilities we've been constructing at, at my lab. On the right hand side, you can see some of the projects that we're doing jointly with Bristol and many other partners, which are, first of all, exploring that exam question of, well, how many, you know, can we go to another times 10 in capacity? Question mark. Wouldn't that be exciting? But we're also exploring how things like AI and the softwareization of some of these technologies could not only improve the capacity available from these future mobile systems, but also improve the connectivity, the reliability, the resilience, and maybe even give us the ability to do things like prioritization. So if you imagine, um, imagine a, a future connected ambulance, um, would we be able to actually direct a beam to follow an ambulance as it's as it sort of tore through a particular area, um, you know, on a blue light mission? Lots of exciting research agendas that that we and Bristol University are exploring together in the coming uh, coming weeks, months, and years. If you flick onto the next slide, Katie, I want to talk about another example very briefly. Um, this is uh, to do with this is to do with this stuff again, quantum key distribution, but this is to do with optical fiber. And if you flip to the next slide, Katie, I'll, uh, I'll develop the story there. So this stuff, although I've been extolling the virtues of this, uh, these amazing hair thin strands of glass, one of the annoying things about them is if you bend them, tiny bits of light can leak out. And if you're a, a naughty person who fancies sticking your detector there, you can detect the light. Now that's not a problem really today because we encrypt our systems and um, therefore data is safe. But in the future, the advent of a quantum computer of the many wonderful things that it will enable, um, one of the things less so wonderful is that it risks cracking our current encryption algorithms. Now there's a whole range of research activities um, that we and others around uh, around the world are looking to solve that particular problem, post-quantum algorithms, post-quantum crypto algorithms, for example. But another uh, layer of security that we've been exploring with um, the academic community and the industry for well over 20 years now is the idea that we could use some of the, the features of quantum physics as a defense against uh, that sort of intrusive eavesdropping and quantum key distribution is one of the solutions that allows us to do that. The idea is really simple, essentially to just use a one time key. The challenge you then got is uh, transmitting that key. And the idea of QKD, uh, which goes back to 1984, is to encode the keys on single particles or photons of light. That's clever because if somebody eavesdrops and pinches the, the photon, it never arrives, so it never gets used. So that seems pretty secure. If somebody eavesdrops and then puts another photon back pretending to be the photon with your key on the laws of quantum physics tell us that any measurement changes the state of the photon and therefore in simple terms we can detect an eavesdropper and of course therefore we know not to use those keys so a beautifully elegant solution a fiendishly difficult uh, engineering thing to achieve because of course you want to send your real data on the on the fiber at the same fiber, which means you're trying to detect individual photons in one channel whilst also having high capacity, high speed data on the same fiber, which means the engineering challenge of detecting these things is really tough. There's also many challenges in integrating these things into classical encryption systems. Now, this is an area where the UK has something of a lead. Uh, the National Quantum Technology Program and specifically the Quantum Communications Program has been working on this uh, and delivering some great results. This is a, a world first uh, that was achieved uh, in 2018 when we took a, a, the first live real world link between uh, the CAPE lab at Cambridge University and um, uh, my lab at, uh, at BT Labs Marshalsham, um, establishing this link. This has been up and running um, for well over a year now, well, what, two years, um, and is a, a really 
useful test bed to see how we can operate this stuff in the live network in real telephone exchanges if you flick onto the next slide katie you'll see that even during lockdown we were very proud to be able to uh, do another uh, first and this is the first uh, customer trial in uh, industrial context this and this is working with the national composite center which i'm sure many of you know is uh, just between bristol and bath and this was um providing uh, you know live customer trial where high speed you know 200 gigabit per second encrypted data is secured with keys being exchanged using quantum key distribution equipment so a really exciting demonstration of um of working the in the of really driving quantum technologies into the real use cases in the real network. And of course, you'll know that uh, Bristol University and uh, and some of the startup, in particular KETS, you can see them on the slide, really strong in this area, an area of mutual interest with BT. You flick on to the next slide, please, um, Katie. So those are some recent things. What's next? I just want to close by giving you a glimpse of a few of the projects that we're working on and maybe just to tee up uh, a, a Q&A. Um, if you flip to the next slide, this is a project that um, we're very excited about. This is the uh, recently secured funding. This is a project led by BT with, with many partners. Um, several of them from in fact many of them from the creative digital media uh, ecosystem that is that in bristol is very strong in the bristol area as many of you know and this is all about if you like the future of video communications and entertainment and interaction this is 5g edge xr is the name of the project uh, and that means that sort of ar and vr but really what you should think about with this project is imagine uh, capturing what we call volumetric video. So imagine live action scenes being captured in 8K video with full volume, capturing the video, processing, encoding, transporting, and then playing out. It's looking end to end at that full, if you like, glass to glass production chain. And the use cases that we're, we have in mind are things like entertainment. You can see there, there's a, um, a live action boxing match going on in that middle graphic and you'll see that those individuals on the sofa have got glasses on so if they wanted to they could get up and walk around the action that's playing out on the coffee table in front of them in full 3d um bottom right you'll see what looks like a dance lesson and that's because it is a dance lesson we actually have a, a nationally significant dance uh, um, uh, class uh, involved in the project dance school um, and they're they're looking at envisaging how this sort of technology could allow them to conduct real live dance lessons virtually if you will seems very very appropriate doesn't it to the other uh, way we've got used to communicating um so you can also think about remote expert type scenarios here communication type scenarios from an engineering perspective this is a brilliant project because it's asking really interesting questions which get not only to network technology and compute and processing and AI, but also physiology. So take, for example, the, um, the live action capture of volumetric video playing out in a headset. Well, where do you put the processing? Is it on the headset? Could be, that would definitely give you processing power, but at what cost? What would the um, ergonomics of that be like? Is that going to make the whole experience uncomfortable, heavy? Uh, are, the, are the VR headsets going to be too expensive and therefore limit take up? If you don't put it in the headset, you put it in the network. If you put it in the network, where do you put it? Deep in the core, will that introduce latency? That means the physiology of the experience becomes unpleasant. Are we going to have people who are suddenly feeling a bit seasick because of the delay that's occurring? So this is a program that's really thinking about understanding not only the use cases, but where does the compute sit in a physical sense? What are the requirements on that compute? What are the latency requirements, the jitter requirements? You know, the whole physiology of how this thing works in these really exciting, I think, but also quite challenging use cases. And of course, this is going to be informing the way we architect future converged uh, 5G uh, mobile networks and fixed networks to ensure that we can sort of put the processing where it needs to be almost a horses for courses network you know put compute where it needs to be to deliver the sort of performance characteristics of whatever application you're talking about super exciting project um, that uh, that we're working on right now you flip to the next slide please uh katie this is um a sort of yeah, com completely different use case but similarly exciting i think um this is a 
uh, a piece of work that we've been doing um, for a little while now, working very closely with a number of partners, um, King's University uh, in particular, um, uh, Ericsson as one of the vendors, uh, but mainly with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Um, and this is all about a connected ambulance. So this is a, a, a really straightforward use case in some ways. It's about getting 5G connectivity to an ambulance. But if you look at the detail of the slide, what you can see is we're providing not just ultra reliable connectivity, not only just high bandwidth connectivity, but doing voice, video, and also something called haptic communication. In fact, flick on um, Katie to the, the next slide. It's possibly easier to get a sense of what's going on here. So these are graphic shots from the, the live trial. Um, top left, you can see a paramedic in an ambulance. Bottom left, you can see a consultant um, in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And on the right, you can sort of see what the consultant's seeing. So that VR headset is essentially placing that consultant in the back of the ambulance, augmenting the experience with live telemetry coming off the patient. So you've got vital signs and such like. Um, not only have we got high quality video and audio and ultra reliability and low latency, we've also got a haptic channel. So the, the paramedic there, you can see he's got a glove on. That's, that's not because his hand's cold. It, it's basically allowing the consultant to control the movement of where the hand of the paramedic goes. The simple use case here is a beautifully simple use case. It's essentially trying to work out what's the next best decision for that patient. Um, do they need to be taken to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital? Do they need to be taken to another specialist centre? Can they be taken home and discharged into the care of a loved one because, you know, they, they, they've not done anything too serious? Um, you know, they've not done anything that requires further intervention. This is a, I love this use case because there's an obvious benefit here, the, the, the patient, but it also, I think, talks to the benefits that flow from what you might think of as task omniscience. You put all the data, including remote expertise, in the right place at the right time, and suddenly you can start seeing multiple layers of value flow. Um, maybe you didn't need to go to the hospital, so you don't go to go through an admissions process, wait in a hospital, tying up more precious resource in order essentially to be discharged again. Maybe you just go straight home. So you've saved miles, you've saved polluting miles, you've freed up the precious resource of the paramedic and the, and the ambulance in order to go and carry on doing their important work. So there's layer upon layer upon layer that can flow from simply just putting expertise where it needs to be when it's needed. Um, this is an exciting use case that we're uh, building on with, uh, with many partners and um, we'll be exploring further. If you flick onto the, uh, the next slide, please. Um, Katie, and this is this is the last use case. This is um, a project we're involved with, and you'll see robotics. Um, Phil mentioned robotics and the the work we've been doing with uh, with Bristol and the uh, the Bristol Robotics Centre uh, around robotics. We do think robotics um, and AI have got huge potential, particularly in an ultra connected world. This is one of the largest um, robotic agri projects going on anywhere in the world. And this is um, looking at soft fruit farming. So uh, I'm sure you can all work out exactly what this use case is. It's thinking about how on earth we can apply the technologies that come from the sort of, you know, our world and the sort of world of um, the experts on this call to the broad area or an important area of, you know, how we in a more sustainable, more efficient way um, can feed ourselves and uh, and uh, and help the um, the agricultural sector, particularly as it gets tougher and tougher and tougher as uh, you know as climate change means less water. Um, we have I, we happen to be based in the driest part of the UK, so, so and East Anglia is one of the main agricultural production areas uh, in the UK. So there's a horrible combination of factors there. Um, we think technology such as this has got a, a real opportunity to help um, rise to some of those wider societal challenges. So this is a very exciting project um, that we've got high hopes for. Flick on to the next slide and I'll maybe just uh, make some closing remarks. So 175 years of purposeful innovation. Um, I've taken you on a sort of an origin story for BT touched on some of the, uh, the the way BT approaches innovation and in particular some of the recent uh, very pleasing um, launches and um, 
services we've managed to bring to the market, um, ably assisted by the uh, the brilliance of uh, Bristol University and uh, and partners around the world. Um, I've then shared with you some of the things we're doing now, some of those things looking to the future. But I think if you stand back from it all, the way uh, BT sees the future is, is pretty much like this. Connectivity we see as something that is gonna be an enduring and increasingly important part of our digital economy. Ultra connectivity, the ability to connect everything. Um, you know, whether that's your, I mean, we're all instrumented, aren't we, with our, with our health monitors and the like, you know, so whether it's your pets or your bins or parking spaces in smart cities or refuge bins in smart cities, connectivity is, is gonna be at the heart of all these things. And therefore the sort of research that goes on at Bristol University in fixed and wireless connectivity has, is, is not only interesting and exciting, but it's got a you know, huge and serious uh, import for the future of uh, our, our connected, increasingly connected um, society. Of course, layered on top of that is trust. All of it falls apart without trust. And therefore, some of the work that's going on around things like quantum, but also the, uh, the classical algorithmic ways of protecting networks is super important. On top of those trust layers and connectivity, though, we start getting into um, what in BT we think of as actionable insight. Essentially, what I've described is that through uh, the brilliance of telecommunications technology and data science, we now have the ability to harvest a huge amount of data. How we turn that data into useful insight is the, if you like, the job of work of future computer science um, activity and doing that in a way that then allows us to make choices such as the connected ambulance, you know, the ability to make that what's the next best choice, um, that human in the loop, AI that allows us to just improve the way we do things, of course, leads to the final block that I put there, which I've rather inelegantly called productivity, which is a sort of a, a nod, I guess, to the, the economists' concern and worry over um, productivity in our nation. But for me, actually, talks much more to actually the societal benefits of us just being able to do things far less wastefully far more quickly, far less stressfully. I mean, I'm always thinking, they're, they're silly examples, but I always think of the, the smart city, you know, the simple act of instrumenting parking spaces. Um, so in the days we used to drive, you're, I'm sure you all recall circling around, trying to find the parking space, full in the knowledge that there is one, but you just can't find it. The simple act of instrumenting parking spaces, um, how much time that saves, how much less pollution there is, how much less stress there is in that process, you know, 50% of most of the cars circling are cars that they want to be driving. That's what the stats tell us on smart cities. They actually want to be parked. You know, so the idea that we can just deliver that sort of task omniscience, delivering the piece of information we need, whether it's in our private lives or our public, you know, in our, in our businesses, to allow us to make better decisions, I think has a profound opportunity to just make everything work a bit better, a bit more efficiently, a bit less wastefully. Um, and I think that's an exciting prospect. So I see the um, the next 10 years or 15 years of this journey of purposeful innovation as one where the, the benefits that can flow um, are huge. And um, BT's purpose statement is to connect for good. Uh, and I think the work that we're doing with Bristol University in these sort of areas, for me, very authentically aligned beautifully with that idea that there is not only cool science, brilliant engineering that many of us on this call just love doing, but there is a very, very serious purpose and a very, very serious benefit that can be delivered to the citizens of this nation and others. Um, so uh, long way we continue uh, in our collaboration on purposeful innovation and uh, I'll stop there Phil and be delighted to to take any um, any questions you may have from the uh, the audience. Thanks very much Tim that was a really inspiring and interesting lecture really nice to hear as well about the the really deep and broad partnership between BT and the University of Bristol uh, where we have focus areas of excellence around the creative and cultural industries climate change adaptation and mitigation, social and infrastructure resilience, and advanced healthcare systems. Uh, all of that with cross-cutting themes of 
digital and data science and social justice. And I think what you described there touched on all of those areas and really shows, I think, why our two organisations are in such good, you know, synchronicity with each other and why we can work together so well. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'll open it up for, for, for questions now. So, um, so Phil, we've got a few questions that have come in already, which we'll, which we'll go to. But just a quick reminder to anyone, if you have a question, if you either type it into the chat or into the Q&A and, and we'll get around to it. So the first question is coming from Paul Coles um, and it's asking, Tim, do you have a view, a view on what area will mean for comms research? Area, of course, is the Advanced Research and Innovation Agency that was announced by the government last month that's going to fund sort of very high risk, but potentially very high reward research. Um, well, hi, Paul, and uh, thank, thanks for the thanks for the question. Um, I, I think my sense is, I mean, it's it, it's good, isn't it, to see um, the government government recognising the value of to society uh, and the UK in particular of research. I think it's too early to say, actually, Paul, in terms of the the specifics, because there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of uncertainty, I think, around the exact you know whys and wherefores of of how ARIA is going to work. Um, so I think it's it's early doors. But I mean, in the you know, if you stand back from it, I mean, I, I'd far rather have a government sort of thinking and believing. And I think we saw this very clearly in their R and D roadmap, and I think we see it in the integrated review which came out last week. There's a really clear sense, isn't it, of ambition to establish the UK. As a science and technology superpower, I think is the is the phraseology, and you know there's a so so I sort of start with a sense of well that's an ambition I can sign up to right because I think I think it's you know it's building on world class you know and I and I don't think this is in dispute world class discovery science I think the UK you know we rank one or two in every area we play in. Um, in terms by citations, for example. So I think on the discovery science, I think that's indisputed. So I think to, to have a government who are sort of turning their attention to, you know, how we harness that and drive, you know, economic and social value um, from is a good thing. Too early to say, I think, in terms of the specifics of ARIA, but I mean, I'm watching it carefully as I'm sure, I'm sure everybody on this call is as well. Lovely, thanks, Tim. Um, and my next question has come in from Mark Ellie. I hope I've said that right, Mark. Um, do you see five G replacing Wi Fi, or do they complement each other? Yeah, that's a cracking question, actually. Um, so I think the way I see that is 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 the, is the latter, complementary, right? Um, you know, Wi Fi is often uh, overlooked, but of course, it's a huge element. I'm sure. You know, the vast majority, and I won't say all because there'll be somebody who's plugged in, but the vast majority, Bill, I'm sure, is, uh, are probably watching this, uh, you know, and are, are, as I am, you know, tetherless, um, Wi Fi'd onto, onto your fixed network. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really important platform. It's a very important platform that, you know, BT takes very, very seriously, as do the, the other operators. And there's a lot of interesting um, research going on looking at the interplay between Wi Fi and 5G and future evolutions of 5G. Um, but I think, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, Spectrum is a, is, a, is a fixed commodity, right? So I think the, you know, the ongoing research that looks at how we can make the very best and the very most of the spectrum we have, um, including the Wi-Fi spectrum and sort of being, you know, multiply connected, I think is the way I see that going. Um, and, uh, you know, and just to just to sort of preempt any other questions, you know, no, I don't see 5G getting rid of the need for fixed either. You know, all of these things, you know, whenever we look at them, they are always complementary. You know, there is a sort of horses for courses dynamic in, uh, in these things. So uh, I'll go with your second option. They'll be complementary. Lovely, thank you. Another 5G question. This time it's coming from Keith Laidlaw and he's asking, what are the timelines for 5G for all of this to be in general availability and UK wide availability? And what about contention and penetration? I'm thinking that's possibly related to some of the 5G Edge XR work that you talked about, Tim. Mm, OK, yeah, it's a good question. So we're cracking on a pace. I mean, these, you know, this is this is big, big up. up I mean, and apologies, I, I can. Um, I can share after the call exactly how many towns and cities we're in now, but it's 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 momentarily slipped from my brain. Obviously, 
Florence starting the piano has managed to managed to <laughs> freak me enough and I've, I've lost it from my head. Um, so we are cracking on a pace in terms of deploying 5G. Um, can't quite recall the stats on, on coverage, but I mean, as we saw with 4G, I mean, remember we launched 4G um, 2012, I think, didn't we? Uh, you know, this is big infrastructure uplift. I mean, that's one of the thing about um, one of the thing about telecommunications is, you know, this is this is hard physical engineering deploying, you know, whether it's fixed network or whether it's radio towers, this this stuff just takes time. Pleasingly, uh, um, you know, we have managed to to keep that pace of rollout even during the uh, the lockdown. You know, we've been uh, with COVID uh, COVID appropriate um, measures obviously but we have been managing to keep uh, to keep the foot on the gas in terms of getting 5g out uh, initially across to cities then larger towns um so that that's going to continue um in terms of contention i mean i think the you know there, there is a there's our, our goal will obviously be and bear in mind 5g and 4g will interplay so 4g is obviously also still rolling out we're still deploying more and more capacity on 4g um, so our goal will basically to be able to put out enough capacity so even that that sharing that does happen won't cause you know contention that can get in the way of any any services but i mean i i would say you know and this is true of the fixed network as well it, it, you know one of the one of the really good things and the really exciting things about this industry and our industry is 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 the growth i mean we've seen um, certainly double digit. I mean, up until the last couple of years, we were seeing 50% compound annual growth in traffic on the broadband infrastructure in the UK. And that's been going on for 15 years, right? So if you do, you know, I think if you do 1.5 to the power 10, you get something like 30 odd, is it 30 or 60? I can't remember. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big um, growth rate. And all of that means these networks that we're rolling out, we've got to build in the future headroom. We've got to be on the game in terms of capacity. And to flip that round to the, the research topic, that means all this work that we're doing, really asking these fundamental questions around what are the capacity limits? What can science tell us? What can AI algorithms and the like do for us in terms of the capacity we can get out of networks, whether it's fixed fiber networks or whether it's the future mobile networks, these are all highly relevant. And because of the gestation period, you know, we need to be doing this research, you know, now. And, you know, you saw the result um, that I was um, uh, talking about from Mark's team, which was a couple of years ago. You know, you'll notice that was significantly higher than anything that I showed you in terms of deployed kit. We need that. We need that sort of after the possible stuff to be seriously ahead of our cadence on deployment because we know we're chasing um, capacity. So, I mean, it doesn't answer your question, but it does sort of hopefully give you some confidence that one of the reasons companies like BT, you know, are investing so much of our time in R&D and working with leading universities like Bristol it is so we can basically try and avoid the thing I think you're hinting at, which is we hit contention and the services isn't so great. Um, so we're, we're on it, but um, we'll, you know, we'll try and avoid that for you. Thanks, Tim. And I can see that that um, that we had some comments in the in the chat that um, oh, 5G from EE is in 125 towns and cities and Portis Head is the most recent town near Bristol. <laughs> thank, you, <laughs> thank you, Nick, for that. There you go. Thank That's you isn't it great having colleagues on the call like that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Nick. So I'm, I'm going to move on to another question here from Martin Cryan. And he says, what role do you see for millimeter wave and also terahertz in future comm systems? Mm. Those are really good questions. So, I mean, the millimeter wave stuff. Um, obviously, we've you know we've been exploring that. We've been doing measurements on it, and there will be, I think, instances where that 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 does you know um, form a purpose. I mean, what we're doing at the moment, obviously, is deploying from you know, macro base stations. So we're putting out these big canopies of of coverage from our macro centres in, as I said, 125 towns and cities. Thank you, Nick. Um, the millimetric wave stuff is, I think, when we get into wanting to put very, very high capacities down, probably in an urban context. Um, so thinking more sort of small cell type deployments. Now, the challenge with millimeter wave is is, is, is twofold, really. A, it, it really does go in straight lines. It doesn't diffract much. It doesn't bend much as it go, you know, as you hit a building. So you get shadowing. So you really do have to have line of sight. And it also doesn't go through things very well. 
So, you know, you've got to, you, as always, there's a trade off. You get oodles of capacity, but the propagation characteristics are, are far less, um, far less forgiving. You know, so if a tree grows, then it doesn't go through trees very well. So you suddenly, you know, you get very variable um, coverage. So that's a, a very active research topic to see what we can do about that. And that, you know, that's something, again, that the, the, uh, the wireless team at Bristol are really looking at uh, to help us understand and this is that that beautiful bit of applied research, you know, because it's not just about the, you know, the whizzy headline speed you can get. It's the whole techno-economic story. You know, what are the economics of this? And also the 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 performance story, you know, the customer experience would be pretty rubbish if you deploy this stuff, you know, and here I've got it. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it's back in. Oh, it's gone. You know, that, that could happen if if you're not careful. So. The work we're doing in the labs really is is about understanding all these limits in a real world context and then essentially matching that with the use cases which can really take the benefit from it so i'm sure it will absolutely find a role and indeed you know there are use cases already and um, certainly in, in a fixed context in a fixed wireless access context millimetric wave um, has uh, has application already in in some markets around the world and certainly we're looking at it in uh, you know particular use cases um, on the terahertz stuff, uh, again, we're we're sort of watching that because it's 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 super interesting. But in all honesty, I don't think we've we've kind of worked out exactly what the use case would be for that. But back to what I said before, you know, we we we've been here before and we've had you know twenty years of fifty percent compound annual growth in capacity. So we just know that we need to keep an eye on these new ways, these things that offer, I mean terahertz potentially offers huge capacities. So it's a, it's an area we definitely you know want to keep an eye on. And uh, what I'd say is flip it around if you get, if you get any ideas, give me a call. Um, you know, get in touch. Um, because we're we're watching it with great interest. Okay, I, we're almost at the end. I think we've got time for one very quick answer to this, which is a fantastic question from um, Demetra Simeonidou. And it's, is there an opportunity for the UK to become a global leader in future telecom technologies? And, and if so, what, you know, what might that opportunity be and what are the timescales? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. Um, uh, and I, I think I, I think yes, um, Demetra. Um, I mean, it's a it's a it's a big, bold ambition. Um, and you know, I think one of the, I think the softwareization of our industry that's that's happened um, it, in very large part driven by UK by you know some of the work uh, from Bristol and Dimitri your, your own your own department driven by as you know work from BT that softwareization and opening up of things I think does open the open the opportunity for companies to get into a space where historically maybe ten years ago they couldn't in terms of time scale though. You know, I think there's there's niche opportunities. There's things we could do in niche areas really, you know, quite quickly. And by quite quickly, I mean in a sort of four or five year period. Mainstay, though, global leader, I think is what you said, Demetra. I think, you know, being realistic, that's a 10 to 15 year um, time horizon. I think if we were bold enough and as a nation, we organized ourselves, we've got all the uh, the potential to do it. It's a matter of uh, commitment and ambition. Uh, and I think that'd be a cracking thing for us to go after. But it's, I think one has to be realistic about that. And I think it is that sort of big, bold ambition, but 10, 15 years time, I think. But, I, you know, I'd love to hear your view. I know I can't on this call, but I'd, I'd love to get your view and then subtract on that as well. Have we got any more, Carol? We have got a few more. Are people happy to stay on a little bit longer? Let's let's go for it anyway. So I've got one here from from Marina Travasari, and she says, "Where does Open RAN sit in terms of BT's priorities for purposeful innovation?" Yeah, no, we're, well, we're we're part of all the forums. Um, we're actively contributing uh, in Open RAN and uh, through um, the TIP process in particular. Uh, we've done a number of. Um, uh, trials of the technology so we're very active we're um, you know exploring it um, and certainly I mean in a way in my mind when I said there are certain use cases it, it was it was open round that I was actually thinking of you know I think there are use cases um, that we can see in that sort of nearer term horizon where open round really absolutely can can do some good um, but I think into you know this is that that realism bit 
you know, it, it, and, and expand it beyond open RAN, expand it beyond just that, that element of the network, expand it into opening interfaces more broadly. That's, I think, where you stretch out some of the time horizons. But I mean, if you're interested in BT's activities on open RAN, then just drop me a line. Um, Paul Crane, uh, my director of networks uh, research, I'm sure be delighted to put you in touch with the team who are, who are, you know, actively engaged and driving and supporting the activity. Okay, uh, and another, another fabulous question that's come in from um, Ivana Tempovsky. I hope I've said that correctly. Um, what manufacturing capability would you like to see in the UK to support future telecoms? <laughs> that is a cracking question. Well, I mean, ultimately, wouldn't it be lovely if you, if you know, if as a event, uh, you know, a, an operator like VT or any of the other operators, you know, that we uh, we had. Um, a British manufacturer capable of providing kit that could go into into our main macro networks in wireless and our you know our main optical core networks. I mean that you know that's that's the bold ambition, right? That would be lovely to have that choice. Um, I think that's you know that's that's when I say you know a decade or more. I think you're going to be realistic about these things, but it'd be lovely to have that choice. Um, and from a raw ingredient perspective, you know, the, the, the UK has much to offer. I, I think at the, you know, if you get down to the subsystem level, of course, there are some, you know, real strengths in the UK, the photonics industry in the UK, um, which, you know, which I know well from in my own background, my own research background, it is, is really strong and is obviously a supplier into many um, global industries. So there's a, there's a lot of strength in the UK that, you um, I think with uh, you know the right uh, the, the the right ambition and the right plan, you know could uh, could could present viable options uh, for companies like BT in terms of you know some of the decisions we make on the technology that we we deploy. Lovely, and we've got one one last question, um, a completely different question from Mike Williams, and that is, other than healthcare, in what other areas do you see happening? having a significant impact <laughs> that's a really good question Mike actually um, yeah I, it, I mean healthcare is the one that always springs to mind but I mean if you if you stand back from that healthcare example essentially what you've got is you know a domain expert interacting with an expert who just doesn't quite have that that absolute expertise and haptics forming you know just an extra layer of communication that physicality that sort of i'm going to guide your hand now if you if, if you do that well then there's vast numbers of applications aren't there industrial um automation type things industrial uh, maintenance type things indeed our own use cases i mean one of the things we're looking at with uh, ar and vr is essentially remote experts to our own you know change change the doctors out I mean, they might still be doctors but they're not medical doctors you know put somebody in front of a you know a big high-end uh, high packet processing switch deep in the core of our network and put one of our engineers in front of it you know those are big complex machines that you don't want to muck around with right because they're carrying critical national uh, you know they're carrying all your data right you nobody wants the network to go down so there are instances there, either in training or in you know live network operations things, where being able to beam in that expert from our company or from you know uh, a supplier, you know an external expert, is really useful. And you can imagine in that scenario, as well as audio and video, actually touch wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? Because if it's about guiding somebody's hand, <laughs> they they do that, they they press the right button, then I could you know. So there's there's a whole. I think if you sort of step away from it and just imagine it was a thing that we just did you'd suddenly find almost every use case that you could imagine where you want a remote expert, you'd think, well, that'd be a nice thing to have, wouldn't it? Um, so I, I don't know, that's a very good answer, Mike, but it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and one uh, well, we should think about a bit more and we'll think about a bit more. I've got two super suggestions come up in the chat, Tim. One of them is um, haptics for virtual hugs, which it says we all need now. And also <laughs> haptics for dance, so you can have a virtual dance partner and recreate strictly in your own house. <laughs> well you know we've got dance east on the uh, on the project so let's let's see if they fancy um, yeah let's let's get some haptics uh, components in there as well we'll take that away and see what see what they think you wouldn't want me as a dance partner by the way two left feet it's uh <laughs> you really wouldn't 
so we've come to the end of the submitted question so Phil I'm going to hand back to you. Thank you Carol and, and thanks very much Tim for a fantastic talk and a, a really stimulating Q&A session. Thank you for everybody who's joined us and, and posed those fantastic questions. I think you can see that the, the work that BT are doing with us collaboratively at the University of Bristol really underpins pretty much all aspects of society, economy, the environment, healthcare, everything you can think of. And the possibilities are endless and really exciting. And um, I do think that, that um, you know, the UK can really become a, a, a world leader in this space, as, as Tim said, maybe in niches to start with, but we can build from there. And I, I, I would say that I think that the way that we do that is through collaboration, really high quality interactions, really high quality collaboration between all sorts of different sectors, communities, society, industry, academia. And I think we heard a lot of that tonight from Tim. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, as Tim said, I hope that this will become a feature each year where we really come together and share ideas and share inspiration in this fantastic sector. So uh, thank you, everybody, but special thanks to Tim. Thanks, Phil. And uh, maybe you can start each one with a 13 year old starting doing a piano lesson just to just to add an extra bit of comedy to the, <laughs> to the evening. I think you've set a precedent there or <laughs> your daughter has set a precedent there. I'm going to go and have to apologise <laughs> to Florence <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, thanks, everybody. It was lovely fantastic. to chat. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Stay safe.